Southeast Radio's Business Matters with Carl Fitzpatrick. Southeast Radio. Welcome back to Southeast Radio's Business Matters with me, Carl Fitzpatrick. I'm now joined by our resident employment law expert, Adrian Toomey from Jacob and Toomey Solicitors. Adrian, the COVID-19 pandemic has had a dramatic impact on everyone for the past number of weeks. But this week in particular, we have seen many employers being forced to close their doors because of lockdown. For the affected employees, what impact does this have on their employment? And what are the obligations for employers in terms of paying their staff? Well, Carl, it's, it's been an exceptional last few weeks, extraordinary uh, situation that all businesses are having to deal with. But I suppose for most businesses, the impact that they've seen over this last week has been that, firstly, many of them are not able to trade. Many of them have been directed, in fact, to close their doors. And for most businesses, they'll be finding that their employees are not permitted to come to work under the government guidelines simply because they're required to stay at home except for uh, the limited range of circumstances that we're all now familiar with. Now, in those circumstances... It's impossible to perform the employment contract. It's impossible for employees to work. It's impossible for employers to permit them to work. Um, And I think in the long term, the courts and the Workplace Relations Commission will come to regard this as effectively a situation where contracts of employment are temporarily suspended. The situation, of course, is different if you're involved in providing essential services. So, Adrian, if a business provides an essential service and their employees cannot work from home, Are they permitted to travel to work? Yes, but even then, Carl, it's only if the employees themselves are essential. And that's a call, that's the big call that governments are asking uh, employers uh, to make themselves. Now, that covers the employees, but what if only some of the employer's business is essential? Now, that's giving rise to to some difficulties because uh, I've spoken to a number of companies over the last week where their business is within the scope of essential services as the government has classified it. Um, And they're seeing, many of them are seeing uh, exceptional demand for some of their services or products, particularly if those are services or products that are required in the battle that the health service is waging against COVID-19. On the other side of the fence, however, there are aspects of their businesses that have gone dead. So you could imagine a situation where Uh, A company is um, manufacturing gowns for uh, hospitals or masks for hospitals, but they also uh, manufacture a range of other plastic equipment um, that that there's no need for. Well, the employees who are involved in the manufacture of that other plastic equipment aren't essential and are likely to be laid off. So let's take the example of a local barber shop or hairdressing salon. What happens with them and their staff? Sadly for them... Uh, They're not in the category of essential services at present, and so the employees are unable to attend at work. The employers are compelled to close their premises. Um, And in those circumstances, we're going back to the the earlier scenario I I, I outlined, um, where effectively their employment contracts, the employees' employment contracts, are temporarily suspended. So in that situation, there are two main options open to employers at the moment. Either they can ask their employees to avail of the COVID-19 pandemic unemployment payment of €350 a week, where the employee applies directly to social welfare, or um, if payment is continued by the employer, they can apply um, to the state uh, to avail of the 70% COVID-19 wage subsidy scheme. Now, Adrian, I'm glad that you mentioned the COVID-19 wage subsidy scheme. There has been some controversy about that scheme over the past week to 10 days, and much of it seems to have been caused by comments coming from solicitors. What is your view of the scheme, and how should employers be approaching it? Um, that's, that's an incredibly complicated question, Carl, because the scheme itself is riddled with, with grey areas. When the Taoiseach and the Minister for Finance announced the introduction of this scheme, it sounded to me like a great idea because what they're trying to do is avoid a situation where employees are perhaps unnecessarily uh, laid off or made redundant. The content of the legislation involves plenty more complexity okay, and a lot more subtlety, 
and difficulty than I originally envisaged when I heard the Taoiseach and Minister's announcements. So there are a number of declarations that employers need to make to revenue in order to avail of the scheme. And for many employers, it's going to be a good idea to avail of that scheme, and the scheme itself, I think, is well-intentioned. But the legislation that governs it says that the employer must firstly be able to declare to revenue that it foresees a 25% decrease in turnover between the 14th of March and the 30th of June 2020. So that involves a degree of crystal ball gazing on the part of (laughs) any company. Secondly, you have to declare to revenue that you're unable to pay your normal wages and normal outgoings. Now, that declaration is one that caused a lot of panic and concern on the part of many solicitors up and down the country. Because as we sit here today, if you are unable to pay your normal wages and normal outgoings to your employees, then clearly you're dicing with insolvency. And if a company is dicing with insolvency, then it's in danger of straying into the territory of reckless trading, for example. So you're, you're effectively being asked to make a declaration to the revenue that suggests, at least at face value, that you're in that territory and that you're close to closure. And that's why solicitors have been concerned about it. The other point that gave me some concern about it was that they intend to publish the names of all employers who um, want to or who apply to avail of the scheme or who do avail of the scheme after this current emergency is over. And that's fine. And of course, there's an entitlement on the part of the public to know who's availing of public funds in order to bolster their businesses. But I just wonder if two years down the line, a company's name is appearing on that list and they're looking for credit uh, from a supplier. Will that supplier go back and look at um, how the business stood when we hit the crunch with COVID-19 and wonder, well, if they were in difficulty and couldn't survive for two to three months at that point due to a 25% downturn, will they survive now and will they pay me back? So, Adrian, what you're saying is these guidelines are far from black and white. And on that basis, are you saying that businesses should steer clear of the COVID-19 wage subsidy scheme? I wouldn't go that far, Carl. But I do think businesses, in assessing whether or not to avail of the scheme, need to very carefully consider the requirements and the declarations that they're going to have to make to revenue. It's definitely not suitable for everyone. I suspect it will give rise to problems for some at a later date. But where an employer is in real and immediate trouble and can't afford to top up wages, it may be attractive. And I'm sure many, many employers and their staff will benefit from the scheme, particularly in the short term. I'm just saying approach with care, really, Carl. Adrian, on a different topic, if employers are placing staff on either temporary layoff or temporary short time, what process do they need to follow? Well, I think the first thing that a lot of companies did on Monday morning was write to their employees and say, look, as a result of the government's announcements um, and your inability to travel to work right now and our inability to open, um, obviously in those circumstances, you won't be attending at work this week and uh, it's impossible for us to permit you to do so. Um, They don't necessarily then tell the employees they're being laid off the employees are precluded from coming to work because of the government's uh, diktat. Um, but um, where, where it's possible for people to attend at work and businesses are still open uh, in terms of providing essential services, then notice of layoff has to be given to people who are being laid off. Um, that usually takes a written form. Some are using uh, an existing statutory form that's available for download online, although that's a little misleading in the current crisis. Uh, what we're doing with our clients is we're giving them a letter that they can issue to their employees. Most of them are having to email that, obviously, in circumstances where they're not meeting face-to-face with people. Um, But I think communication is important. So it's very important that over the next period, we do manage to at least remain in contact with our employees by telephone or email. I think the wise employer, the wise business, will be letting its employees know that it It is concerned that the situation may continue and that it will communicate with them further as matters develop. And Adrian, in a business where layoffs are taking place, what happens to pension contributions? Do they continue to be paid or can they be suspended? Well, it'll vary from business to business because it depends on the pension scheme and in particular the trustee and rules applicable to that pension scheme. So 
any business that's got an occupational pension scheme needs to talk to its pension administrators at the moment to see exactly what's required. But in general terms, Carl, if an employee is not getting paid, then there's no pay from which they can make a tax-deductible contribution. And in terms of employer contributions, again, the pension scheme rules will dictate, but um, as a, a sort of a broad sweep approach or broad brush approach to the issue, um, I would say to you that if somebody's not attending at work, then they have no entitlement to pay in benefits. One of the benefits is the employer's contribution to the pension scheme. I know that um, pension scheme administrators and pensions lawyers up and down the country are working frantically to get as much clarity for people as they can at present. I think generally speaking, we'll find there are no pension contributions being made uh, in relation to most employees at the moment. And what is the position for employers in relation to other employee benefits, such as health insurance and that? Well, the general rule there will apply again. So if somebody's not attending at work, through no fault of their own, but through no fault of the employers either, then they, they generally speaking, will have no entitlement to be paid. Now, employers should check their employment contracts to see exactly what they provide. But um, all else being equal, uh, there's no entitlement to continuing benefits. The particular one that you mentioned, Carl, uh, health insurance is obviously of crucial importance at the moment. So it's absolutely vital that employers check their arrangements with uh, the VHI or LEA or whoever else might be providing a health care insurance um, uh, service for them and ensure that all employees have continuity of benefits, even if that means contacting your employees and saying, look, you'll need to take over this policy by the end of the week in order to ensure that you have continuity because the last thing that anybody needs right now is to find that they get sick particularly with COVID-19, require hospitalisation and hospital treatment, and they subsequently end up with a bill that they would not otherwise have expected. So that's a very important point, Carl. It is a very important point indeed. Adrian, lots of Wexford businesses will have laid off employees over the last few weeks, and more will presumably have to do so in the weeks and months to come. Can those employees demand to be paid statutory redundancy payments during COVID-19? At the moment... They can't, Carl, and I'll explain why. Under normal circumstances, if an employee is laid off or put on short-time working, or they're working less than half their normal hours, and that situation persists for more than four weeks, so if you're laid off for more than four weeks, then you can go to your employer and give them notice that you want a statutory redundancy payment. The business then has four weeks within which to reply, and if it can reply and guarantee that it will give the employee a certain period of uh, consistent and continuous employment thereafter, there's no problem. If it can't give that guarantee, then normally the employee is entitled as a matter of statutory right to get a statutory redundancy payment, and that brings the employment to an end. Fortunately, government spotted that particular problem and did address it in the legislation that was introduced just over a week ago. So the Emergency Measures Act provides that the normal statutory rules, the ones I've just described, are suspended between the 13th of March and the 31st of May. So no employee can demand a redundancy payment between that period. And Adrian, what happens in a situation where in a post-COVID-19 pandemic that a business reopens but it's not in a position to bring back its full complement of staff? Well then, we might have a situation where temporary layoffs continue for some period. Um, In those circumstances, if the suspension of the normal rules that I talked about Uh, doesn't continue. If the normal rules kick kick back in, employees will be able to demand a statutory redundancy payment. Or if the employer doesn't see itself ever being able to bring those employees back, then they'll be issuing notice of redundancy. um, And and that's going to be a significant cost for those businesses. There were rumours just over a week ago that the state would uh, step up and pay those redundancy lump sums. Where employees find that their employers are just not in a position to pay that statutory redundancy entitlement, then they can apply for direct payment from the Social Insurance Fund. But that's going to be one of the many messes that we're going to have to clear up after all of this is over. And on the other side of the fence, Adrian, there are essential workers out there who are genuinely concerned about their own health and safety and the fact that their families might be exposed to an increased risk of catching COVID-19. Can they refuse to attend work? And if so, what happens then? 
if they're afraid to come to work, then the first question that any employer will ask is, well, well why? Is there a particular concern? Do you have an underlying health condition? Uh, are you showing symptoms of COVID-19? Um, is there a particular aspect of the work that uh, you feel we're not putting appropriate measures in place to protect you? Um, and, and then an employer can respond to any of those concerns. If they have an underlying health condition, for example, then it's important that they notify their employer of that fact. And I think most um, genuine employers uh, in those circumstances would look for medical advice. And if the medical advice is this person should self-isolate, well then I don't think any reasonable employer would require them to attend at work and they'll become entitled to illness benefit for COVID-19 absence, even though they themselves are not yet sick. If, on the other hand, it's an irrational fear uh, or there's no basis for the fear other than the general sense of fear that the, uh, the population is feeling, um, then they can be directed to attend at work, although I haven't encountered any employers who are taking that pretty stern or strict approach to date. Most people are trying to facilitate their employees insofar as they can. Um, the second element of the question, I think, Carl, related to, to danger money, and it, it has been interesting this week to see a number of retailers acknowledging the fact that their employees are uh, continuing to attend at work, probably working even longer hours than, than normal, um, and that they are exposed to a greater degree of risk than members of the public who are remaining at home. And there have been some temporary pay increases and bonuses negotiated, agreed or offered. But there's no entitlement to that. Well, if you've just tuned in, that was employment law expert Adrian Toomey from Jacob and Toomey Solicitors. And I would like to thank Adrian for clarifying the current employment law landscape which exists at this present time. Southeast Radio's Business Matters with Carl Fitzpatrick.